Our title tonight is The Two Models of Rain Seen Through Saul and David. So we are learning about Volume 3 of the History of Redemption series, The Unquenchable Lamp of the Covenant. And we have learned about the genealogies in Matthew 1, and we know David was mentioned in this precious genealogy. So in Matthew 1, the genealogy of Jesus Christ, we see that out of the many kings of Israel, only David has the title king. So in Matthew 1 genealogies, David appears as the only king with the title of king next to his name. So this means that the only human king that is recognized or acknowledged by God is David. So there are many names recorded in the Matthew genealogies. They were kings, but only one was recorded as a king, and that was David. And David's name is recorded a total of five times in the genealogy of Matthew 1. And in the five recordings, he is recorded once as a king. So in Matthew 1 genealogy, God is acknowledging David as the king. And we see this in Matthew 1, 6. It says, Jesse was the father of David the king. And then again, David is recorded. So in the Matthew 1 genealogies, we see David's name comes up often. He is a very important figure in the Matthean genealogy. Now, if we look at the book of 1 Samuel, this book is named after the prophet and judge Samuel. But most of the events concern Saul and David, especially in 1 Samuel, we see the records in detail of the period in which Saul becomes the first king over Israel until his death that came in battle. So in 1 Samuel, there is many events recording what happened to Israel's first king, Saul. And there are also some events that record David as well. So then what is the essence of the book of 1 Samuel in the Bible? It recorded first the life of Samuel. Then it recorded the ending of the judges period. And that was the period of sin when people saw to do fit what was in their eyes and not God's. So at the end of 1 Samuel is the ending of this judges period. And then later, through Samuel, we know that Saul was anointed as the first king of Israel. And then David became the second king. So Samuel anointed Saul and David. And this is what is detailed in 1 Samuel. So through this, God shows what conditions must be met for a human leader to be called king and how he is to rule under God's sovereignty. So through Samuel, Saul and David were anointed as king but they were to rule under God's providence. God was supposed to be the true king. So let us compare Saul and David. How did they act as kings? 
Tonight, we are going to learn the importance of their reigns and how they reigned as kings. So, then what did Saul and David have in common? What did they have in common? Number one, Samuel anoints them both as king. So, this was their common feature. They were both anointed as king by Samuel. Second, They were both filled with the Holy Spirit and then they began their work as being a king. So, Saul and David, they both had a good beginning because they were both filled with the Holy Spirit in the beginning. 1 Samuel 10 10 records this. So before Saul became king, it says the Spirit of God came upon him mightily. So this is a good start. And in 1 Samuel 11 6, it also says, Then the Spirit of God came upon Saul mightily when he heard these words. And then he began his work as a king. And it was the same for David. In 1 Samuel 16 13, The Bible records that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David. And then what happened? The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David. So Saul and David both had this common feature. After they were anointed, they had the Holy Spirit of God upon them. And after this, they started their work as king. And what is their third commonality? They both ruled for 40 years. In Acts 13 21, we see the time of reign for Saul. It said, God gave them Saul for 40 years. It is recorded here. And in 2 Samuel 5 4, it says, David, he reigned 40 years. So both records record that they both reigned for 40 years. So what is God showing us here? It is showing us that God gave Saul and David the same conditions. And the same opportunities. So we cannot say that God loved David more because the same conditions and opportunities existed for both of them. However, Saul's throne ended in such a devastating manner. But what about David's throne? God sealed his throne with the covenant. That his descendants would reign for eternity. So David's reign, his throne never ended. So Saul fell, but David's throne, it was established forever. He was the unquenchable lamp of the covenant because the Messiah was to come as a descendant of David. That is why David was lifted up. And his throne is eternal. Luke 1 31 through 32. It says that Jesus, he would be born, and that he will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. So David is lifted up. Why? Because Jesus Christ would come through his line. So, because the Messiah would come through David's line, David's throne was eternal. So, we know human kings are appointed by God. But why is this? Why are human kings appointed by God? 
What is the purpose for God appointing human kings? Who is supposed to be the real king? It is God. God is to be the king of kings, the true king. And then he gives them, the kings, the mission of a royal priesthood. So a king who rules over a nation is king of that nation. But in reality, God wants them to fulfill the mission of a priest. Why? To intercede between God and the people so that God can rule as the true king, the true ruler. But Saul could not do this, but David did. He fulfilled this purpose as a royal priest under God. So if you live according to God's reign, to God's authority, you will live with blessings forever. But if you do not live according to God's authority and you make yourself king in your life, God cannot use you, just like it happened for Saul. Now we must know that there is a redemptive historical lesson found in 1 Samuel. So we know Saul and David were anointed by God to be kings. And Samuel had anointed them with oil. But what is the redemptive, redemptive historic, historical lesson here found in this? So the Holy Spirit is the anointing oil. So this is what we must learn today. In our lives as saints, we are to be anointed by the Holy Spirit and ordained as God's royal priests. We are like these kings, but we cannot be like Saul. We must be like David. We cannot fall into the trap of having the wrong focus in our heart like Saul had. If we live like Saul, we will fall in a devastating manner, just like Saul. But if we live like David, we will be eternally kings, as God, as our true king, living in the kingdom of God. So we are not the actual kings, but we are the royal priests who act like kings who mediate for God. We teach the people God's authority. So we, as royal priests, must connect God's people to God. So their beginning was the same, but their end was different. It was a complete opposite of each other. So then what was the difference, the crucial difference between Saul and David? They had the same conditions as king, but what happened to Saul and David? It is this, Saul did not focus on God, but David always had God as his focus and the center of his heart. So for David, God never left him. God was always near him, in his heart. And this was the crucial difference between Saul and David. So Saul, at first, he was humble. He was obedient. And he started out with great faith as king. However, he began to disobey the word and it caused him to leave God. So in 1 Samuel 15, 23, the Bible records this. It says, because you have rejected the word of the Lord, he, also, he has also rejected you from being king. And this is about Saul. So why is rejecting the word such a bad sin? It is, because, it is because the word is God. So when you are rejecting the word, you are rejecting God. 
and we know this from John 1 1. The Word is God. So, in this way, if the Word of God is not valued and we discard Him repeatedly in our hearts, then in the end, God will leave that person. And that could happen to us as well. So, please do not be a superficial saint. Do not just be an outward believer, but inwardly in your heart. Do not reject the word. Obey it. Be humble to the word. We must listen and follow the word. God's word, if we reject it and discard it, then we must know that we are leaving God. And this is what happened with Saul. So as a result, what happened in 1 Samuel 16, 14? It is this. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord terrorized him. When the Holy Spirit departs, your heart doesn't just become empty. Definitely another spirit, an evil spirit, will come in and torment that person. It says it here, an evil spirit. When the Holy Spirit departs from us, then evil comes in. Do not think that you will be void. When God's Spirit leaves you, you will have the evil spirit. So please pray that it will never leave you. I bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. We do not want an evil spirit in us. We want God's spirit. So what then was Saul's fatal problem that caused all of this? It is something that all saints have problems with. And it is this. Saul focused too much on what people thought. And don't we have this problem too? The God we cannot see, we have more concern for the people we can see. We cannot be like Saul. And last Wednesday, we talked about this. We said Saul's first and second sins were what? It was a result of being influenced by men. Saul was shaken by the words of men, so he fell, not once, but twice. And as Saul continued in this tendency of listening to people, his favor for his faithful servant David left him. So after David, he killed the Philistine giant Goliath. We know the people praised David. What did the people say? They said in 1 Samuel 18, 7, they said Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. See, they compared Saul to David. They said Saul only killed thousands while David killed ten thousands. So thousands, that's a lot of people, especially to kill. But for Saul, what was the problem? He didn't want to be compared to anyone else. So he had a heart of envy, jealousy. He compared himself. So the scariest thing in our life of faith, the bacteria, that sin, it's comparing ourselves to others. Don't compare yourself to other people because when you do this, God departs. You push God away. Because if you only focus on God, you won't focus on people and them comparing you. In 1 Samuel 18, verses 8 and 9, it says this. So David was praised. And then it says, then Saul became very angry. And in verse 9, it says, and Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. So we are telling you how you depart from God. It's when you focus on people instead of God.
If we focus on God, we will live. But Saul shows us if we focus on people, we will live a sour life. So for us, we must have a heart that has God in the center. Do we do this or not? So please do not fall like this. Don't just look at people. Don't be jealous of them. Because if you depend on people, remember, they could betray you. So don't depend on them. Don't focus on them. Only focus on God. He won't betray. He is faithful. So in this land, no matter who hurts you, God will protect you and believe you will enter the kingdom of heaven. Please believe this. Don't live a life like Saul did. So Saul, in the end, he lost that great battle against himself. He lost the battle to overcome darkness in his heart. So look carefully. Saul, why did he fall? Did he start out bad? In the beginning, his start was great. He had a great war to fight, and he won, and he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. It was in the end. That is when he fell. And David followed him, obeyed him. He had a great servant helping him. And God helped Saul. But what happened? Saul's heart changed. He did not listen to God. He listened to people. And that's when he went lower and lower. So what is the lesson we can learn here? If we look at the Bible, we see that Saul got angry a lot. Isn't that our image too? We get angry a lot. We get resentful, envious. We have hatred in our hearts. And we speak evil words that come from within. And that's not a problem with just our feelings. It is a serious darkness that determines whether or not we will be saved. So Saul could not get rid of this darkness in his heart. and That's why he fell in the end. He wanted praise from people, and that is why he fell. Proverbs 4.23, it warns us, In this world, what do you need to take care of the most? Your heart. Watch over this the most. If you confess you love Jesus Christ, then watch over your heart. Why? Because it flows the springs of life. It doesn't come from anywhere else. It comes from your heart. In other words, your life depends on whether you guard and control your heart. If you can't control your heart, then you will lose your life, just like Saul. If you watch over your heart, you will be like David. You will be eternally praised because of your good heart. So the decisive point in which we live or die begins right in our heart. And the result comes out through our words. What comes out of our lips, our mouths, are our words. But that comes straight from the heart. That is why Matthew 12, 36 through 37, Jesus tells us, let us read it together. Ready? Begin. But I tell you that every careless word that people speak, they shall give an accounting for it in the day of judgment. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned. Wow, your words are that important. No matter how great your faith is, we must watch what we say, because we will be judged by what we say. So no judge in the world can pierce into the human heart. No human judge can do this. But 
the Bible tells us we will be judged for our words. So in this world, judges, they can't look into our hearts. They judge only on the basis of outside evidence that has been revealed. But God, he looks deep into our hearts and he judges from what he sees in our heart, not just our words and our outward appearance. So outwardly, we could be great, we could be sweet, but God is looking at our heart from within. Are those actions coming from evil or from goodness in your heart? So we must guard our heart. And when we do this every day, we will have peace and be happy. Please believe this. Your heart must overflow with goodness, not money, money. Don't think about that. Possessions, they, it always leaves. It doesn't last forever. And the more possessions you have, the more worry you have. Right? People who don't have much, they have more peace. In Proverbs 16, 32, it tells us the same lesson. Let us read it together. Ready, begin. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he who rules his spirit than he who captures a city. So if we can control our heart and control our anger, it is greater than those who can control a city. Is it easy to control your anger? It is very hard. Look at how many people die because a king is angered. So we know that we have to control ourselves, our heart, our anger. So if we succeed in controlling our anger and controlling our heart, then we must realize that that is the greatest victory. It is greater than capturing a great city. That's how important and how great it is to control our hearts. And God is pleased when we do this. Because when we can control our anger and our heart, then we have life flowing from within. We know this verse very well. Ephesians 4, 26 through 27. It says, Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. What does this mean? It means we can get angry, yes. And there are times when we are enraged, but with that, do not sin and do not hold it until the next day. Because if you hold on to it, then you will sin. Isn't that right? But I put this letter A here. There is a, a meaning for this. It says, be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. And this verse also appears in the footnote of Psalm 4.4. 4. So this verse is actually a footnote of Psalm 4.4. 4. And this is what A means. So what does Psalm 4.4 say? Let us read it together. Ready, begin. Treble and do not sin. Meditate in your heart upon your bed and be still. Selah. So here in Psalm 4.4, it says tremble. But in the footnote, it is also angry. So Psalm 4.4, it has this word tremble and also angry. So in Psalm 4.4, in the New Korean Standard Version, it says, Be angry, but do not sin. Lie in bed, reflect deeply, and weep. It says to cry. So what is this telling us to do? Before the day is over, before you go to sleep, we have to do something when we are angry. Ephesians 
Four twenty six through twenty seven tells us: Do not be angry, do not sin. Don't wait for the next day to be angry too, but let it go. And Psalm four four, the New Korean Standard Version is telling us: Before you go to sleep, what should we do? With that angry heart, pray for repentance and pray for mercy. Why? Because that anger will not go away on its own. Pray to God that you will receive grace to let it go, so that we don't pour out our anger and hatred on others, but remain silent and pray to God and ask for mercy, so that anger will not be let out in sinful ways. And that is how God leads us to be closer to Him. Even in our anger, He tells us to pray to Him. We can't do what we want to do because when we're angry, we yell at people, we throw things, we hurt people. So instead, say, "I'm angry," and pray to God. Say, "God, I know you don't want me to be angry and do sinful things. You are my King, God." Please change my heart, and when you do this, you start to receive His grace, and the next day you will not be angry anymore. So, dear saints, when does the devil come into your heart? It's when you're angry, and you cannot block him. Isn't that right? When you're angry, the devil's right there. He's urging you to react. Do you think when the devil's with you, you're going to do good things? Satan comes in, and he wants you to hurt people. So that's why the Bible tells us: do not be angry. Do not let the next day go forward, because you will sin. Because the devil rides on your anger; he loves it, and he works through your anger. Look at Saul. Saul was so angry because of David, because people compared him to David, and for ten years he desired to kill him. He chased after him for ten years, and what happened? Saul he died a miserable death against the Philistines. And what is the conclusion of our word today? In the end, it matters who you have as king in your heart and who you are ruled by. It matters. So in this world, how can I make money? Who do I get married to? What school do I go to? That's not the most important thing you should be worried about. But it is who you are ruled by. Is it God, or is it by Satan? This is the most important thing you should be concerned about in your life. Who rules your heart? Is God in your heart, or is Satan in your heart? Will you allow Satan to build up his kingdom in your heart? We must be concerned of this the most. Look at Saul and David. They their beginning was the was the same, but their end was drastically different. So when feelings of darkness arise in your heart, envy. Doubt, anger. This means it's time to pray to God about it, because we can't fix it ourselves. In your heart, when you have these terrible, dark feelings, ask God, please take care of it for me. God will fix it. So, for the remaining three days of this week, may God reign in your heart. And nothing and no one else, and know that you are not the king of your lives, but God is. And when you live under His direct reign, then His will can be fully accomplished in your hearts and in your families, wherever you go. I bless this upon you in the name of the Lord. Let us pray. Our living Father God, who reigns in our hearts, we thank you. 
today through the life of Saul and through the life of David, we have learned the most important thing that we must be concerned about in our lives. And we thank you for this. May we know that the king of our lives is not us, but may we make the determination and the conviction that in our lives, that you are our king, so that we will not fall like Saul. And in our lives, we pray that we will establish you and you will lead us as our king, as our father. May we truly have you as the center of our hearts. And all the problems that we cannot fix on our own, you as our king, you will resolve it and you will give us peace and you will directly rule over us and we will be your children at this time in our hearts do we still have hardships and darkness may we confess that I am not king but that I am giving all authority over to you God and all problems and all hardships and darkness also are being passed over to you. So may you resolve it all for us. We pray you will, and we pray in the loving name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us give glory to God.